Is it? I'll do both. Uh, so today we will be talking about uh, zero exploit pwnage. And uh, basically, we're just going to tell you about some of the really basic things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to exploit networks and you know basically take over all the things. Um, as a quick disclaimer, this is a mostly non-technical talk. Um, if you're a pen tester or a security researcher or something, you're probably not going to find this very interesting. Um, but it's fun stuff nonetheless, and it provides results, definitely. Yeah, maybe mildly amusing. All right. All right, so intro, uh, I'm Kyle. This is Jeff. I'm we're, Jeff. We're both consultants over at uh, AppSec Consulting. We do uh, web app, network, PCI. We basically do all the things, and we enjoy them. And uh, let me just apologize now. I've got bronchitis and all sorts of conference crud, so I'm going to let him do all the talk. I've got bronchitis and conference crud, so I'm going to let Kyle do more of the talking. And obviously, He's just up here to look pretty. Well, that's fail. Okay. All right, so uh, first things first, um, we're not really talking about exploits today. Closer. We're not really talking about e exploits today. I mean, there are vulnerabilities, but we're not going to be use utilizing injection flaws. There are no buffer overflows. There's no crazy ODE or leet hacks going on. It's all uh, pretty basic stuff. Um, it's, it's really kind of security 101, but as a pen tester, it's like own all the things 101. Right. As a, and as the, the more business side consultant, I can tell you these are the things that uh, we all get tired of hearing. You need to do security 101. You need to do basics. Um, actually, we probably would like it if companies continued to screw up like this because it keeps us employed. <laughs> this is the stuff we see over and over that we've all heard about for years. So this is just kind of a fun talk to go over what we're still seeing and doing today after 10, 15 years of this. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we see on a daily basis, and that's kind of why I just want to rant about it a little bit, just to get it out of my system, because I've used it all so much that I'm just so sick of seeing the same stuff, and I just, I just want to like pound it into the head of every person that I know now that these are the things you don't want to do, because this is how I'm actually going to own you. All right, um, so not zero day, uh, so zero exploit pwnage. What is that? Well, it's mostly misconfigurations, bad policies, lack of follow through, um, you know, the, the kind of the stepping stones to getting domain admin. Um, it's, it's just really basic stuff and we'll jump right into it. So, um, you talk about misconfigurations and bad policies. One of the, one of the key things I deal with is um, policy in spirit or policy in, in documentation, but we don't follow through and actually apply them. Um, if your organizations are talking the big talk and not actually making sure people are checking checkboxes, and I don't mean compliance, I mean, I mean, the the policy says you will do this, and you don't have someone who's regularly, physically putting fingers on keyboards and making sure you're doing that, um, you have a policy by, uh, you know. Sorry, I'm losing the train. You're, you're doing the spirit of it, or you're not doing the spirit of it, you're doing the letter of it, you're compliance, you're not secure, and Kyle's going to own you all day long. Cool. All right. All right, so the first one that every person ever hears about, and if you're a pen tester, this is probably one of your most successful avenues of attack ever, default passwords, right? Um, so everyone forgets to change them. They're just, you know, install an appliance, uh, install an application, create an account, forget to change the admin password. It's annoying. But uh, the real issue is, well, there's no real issue. It's pretty obvious. Um, we start, we, so uh, recently on a pen test I did, there were actually no exploits in the, I mean, there were probably some if I had spent more time, but all their software was up to patch, so I couldn't fire Metasploit at something. All of their web applications were up to spec, or they were That's a compliance very, check mark. We're, up to, we're patched up to check date. Um, all of their applications were up to spec. I couldn't find any injection flaws. I couldn't find anything that was really terribly vulnerable. Check uh, mark. Check mark. Uh, except I ended up finding a vulnerability in one of their, um, uh, sorry, not a vulnerability. I ended up finding default credentials on their IT support management console. So this is the console that they would 
tell everybody to send their problems to, and then they would log into, and then they would uh, put all the emails together, create nice little threads and autoresponders, uh, and they ended up leaving this sensitive software with default passwords. Um, and I ended up actually finding a lot of uh, things in there that I wouldn't, and, and if it weren't actually for this one key piece of information, I probably wouldn't have able, been able to actually gain any sort of uh, access to their network. I mean, maybe over time, but, but I wasn't ever, God damn, I hate these things. I wasn't ever actually able, I wouldn't have been able to get into their network so easily. Um, and by just doing that, I was able to find uh, database backups, I was able to find credentials that were stored in there and all this sort of stuff, all just because of default credentials. And again, pen testers know, all right, cool, default credentials on your router, oh great, now I can log in and, you know, maybe reroute your traffic, make man in the middle easier, I can just, you know, some uh, appliances allow you to actually capture packets in that interface. It's just a million different things you can do, but it's just, it's so easy to change a password and yet it's, just not done. Okay. Checklists. Checklists. Procedures. Yep. Standard builds. All these things. They're they're painful to put together sometimes. Um, I know when I'm in a support or an operations role, uh, throwing the servers out and getting things up and running and making things work and fixing the problems is is really important. But having established procedures and doing checklists that that follow policy guidance for those sorts of things is critical to addressing those issues. Cool. Uh, so the next one is also something that we see all the time. And in larger companies, they have very set policies on uh, how to do this. But every once in a while, you'll see a, a, a company that has no password sharing policy whatsoever. Um, there's no, oh, hey, the admin will never ask you for your password, so you should never send it. Problem is, every once in a while, you do see companies that do not have this policy and you see them abusing the exact opposite of the policy where they're asking their users to send passwords. Now, if they're asking their users to send passwords, those passwords have to be passed to them somehow. So they're either being sent in emails or support uh, emails or... Or they're or, taped on the wall behind or, the person or, presenting. Exactly. Or uh, sent over IM and recorded or, or just something ridiculous in, in an, an insecure fashion. And they're just everywhere. And this is really useful when you also gain access to an IT administration panel which groups all these emails together because suddenly you have a huge wealth of user passwords that the IT admins collected for you. Yeah, that's helpful. Yep. So there definitely needs to be some sort of policy available or enact that uh, you can follow through. There needs to be reinforcement that users should never send their passwords anyway because if you start telling users, oh, hey, send your password to the IT guy, and then suddenly there's a phishing campaign that claims to be the IT guy, users aren't going to think twice about sending their passwords. They're just going to send them because the IT guy told them to send them their password earlier, so it's cool. They've been groomed to do so. Right? So backup storage security. Um, so backups always contain something sensitive, right? They contain your user database, your uh, email database, configuration files, uh, just everything. Now, if I'm not supposed to be able to access all that information regularly, unless you know I have an, uh, access to the application, if I'm not supposed to be able to get your database or your configuration files, there's a reason for that. It's probably on a stored server or a secured server or a secured application. But if you're going from a secured application and then you're going to go, hey, I'm going to back up all this stuff, and you throw it on an FTP server that's on an unencrypted hard drive and is as default credentials or whatever, that's dumb. You've just completely destroyed any sort of security there. I mean, you may not even bother locking down the secure system because I don't even need to bother the secure system. I can just access the insecure system. And the, so the policy and the, uh, the overarching governance that covers these sorts of problems now, uh, segregation of duties, um, separation of roles, making sure we have role-based access, whether you want to call it that or whether you want it to be the backup dude, but you don't want just anyone to be able to access your backup shares, your tapes. Oops. Sparkly. I didn't know I had a screensaver on. It's okay, I run so, Linux. So having the policies that dictate how data 
information and access are supposed to be protected and separated, and then the follow through to make sure that's happening is how you'll keep people like Kyle out of your network. Right, and and I like to emphasize on this one too because it's just it's so much easier than finding SQL injection on a network. If I can identify where your backups are going and I can attack that server instead, and obviously to get data to that server, there has to be some sort of input, be it uh, FTP or uh, any other secure transfer or insecure transfer. Uh, chances are, I'm going to, if, if I'm in your network, I'm going to be able to somehow intercept that, or I'm going to be able to look up and figure out what the protocol that's everything's being sent over. And if you're using, basically, if you're using bad services or bad protocols to transfer this stuff, it's yes. just, it's not good. Like FTP. FTP is non encrypted, so why are you transferring your user database with social security numbers and emails and credit card numbers over an FTP connection? Because it's inside my PCI zone. It's right. safe. Right. Right. Because nobody can get it if it's inside yeah. our network. Or same HTTP and even SMB. Sending it over SMB, majority of stuff over SMB, if not configured, is insecure because you can just monitor it and pull everything down, and there are a million other things. And in general, it's just it's way more convenient to attack the backup servers than it is actually attack the applications. And then on top of that, if there is no compartmentalization of your backup servers, if if your web app, if your WordPress install is backing up its database to some backup server, and then your private super secret sauce web application or customer database is also backing up to the same server, and I pop your WordPress install, then I have credentials to your backup server. Well, if there's no separation between the backup server uh, and your, your WordPress installs and the super secret stuff, I'm going to have unlimited access to everything else. So it's very convenient. It's definitely one of the uh, examples of putting all of your eggs in one basket. Cool. All right, this is another really lame one. Um, but if, you're ever, if you've ever been a pen tester, if you're a security guy, if you go through stuff, Password reuse, right? If I get a password anywhere, if I get anything that looks like a password, if it's from an email five years ago, I'm gonna try it on it everything. If there is just if there just happens to be one service that has it, that's a win for me. So everybody in here I'm sure is familiar with how to pick a safe password. Who uses password safes? Uh, uh, key pass, one password, whatever. They're great. Their applications, they're written by people, they're, they are still vulnerable. Um, this is not a talk about passwords, this is a talk about the, the big picture and the, the attacker side and how the compliance side works. Your policies, as painful and as, as, um, as pedantic as it can seem, need to tell users how do you pick and choose and rotate safe passwords, what's acceptable. Um, uh, they, they've kind of dropped out of the limelight a little bit, but for a while there, Anonymous was popping um, password files like almost daily on Pastebin. If if you're a pen tester or a security tester, and you're not capturing all of those those public records, or well, they're public now because they're, if you're not capturing all those files and putting them in your rainbow tables, you're just making more work for yourself. Um, this isn't a new problem either. I still have a banner graphic. I was I was telling some colleagues from like 1997, and the big joke it says, "Has your credit card been stolen on the internet? Find out now. Enter your credit card number." And there's a text box. That stuff's 15 years old, and people still do it. Um, reusing passwords, you know, GPU cracking. We all know passwords suck. We shouldn't be using them, but it is what it is. I'm not going to talk about how to fix it. I'm going to talk about how to protect your users. They need to have the policies, and you need to get in their face. This is the, this is the you know, I'm the nice security guy. We can fix everything for you. You need to say your users suck. They don't know how to pick good passwords. You need to teach them. If they reuse them, you need to do something about it because he'll get you every single time on this. It's always the first step into whatever the first layer of the attack is. It's yep. almost always something like that. And then I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the anonymous leaks and all that because about a year and a half ago we did an assessment for a very large company and um, we ended up getting in 
by uh, searching Google and Pastebin and all those other places for uh, unique usernames and, that we knew that existed in the company and emails that we knew that existed in the company. And we ended up actually finding a leak that included a developer's email account and password in, uh, for the company that we're working for on Pastebin. Well, that's great. Like We tried the password on uh, you know, their corporate account. Doesn't work, no big deal. But, and I'll go into this next, uh, we ended up discovering that they used that same password elsewhere on another service. Uh, and that one is a really good step through to the next one that I want like to Like Gmail. <laughs> no, like some sort of remote access software, such like as LogMeIn. repository. <laughs> <laughs> yes, has been. So it turned out this user reused their uh, password from a long time ago that was leaked. And then they reused that software, actual, or that password, on the software, remote desktop software, log me in. Uh, and this is awesome because that user was still an employee of this company. And their solution to working remotely was to install log me in on all of their corporate provided hardware. So their servers, their desktops, their, it, I mean, it was Windows and Ubuntu desktops and, and whatever. They installed LogMeIn on like four of those different devices and then used the same password that was leaked like a few years prior. You're fired. You're fi <laughs> yes. And then that was actually a really good segue into this one. Uh, remote access software. So VNC sucks. Don't use it ever. Really. Like it's got an eight character limit. It's not encrypted. It, it's... It just is not a good solution to remote desktop software. It's... It's shitty. I, I see it everywhere. It's, it's Telnet with bitmaps. <laughs> I see it. Uh, I've seen it on so many pen tests where they'll, inc they'll, they'll install it across the whole network. And then once you get into one of those servers or you get one to one of those applications that you get it, you can dump the password, unencrypt the password because none of them encrypt, none of them hash the password. All the passwords are encrypted in some format and you can easily unencrypt unencrypt them. Uh, Metasploit even has a module for it. It's awesome. Once you dump that password, suddenly you have access to every other single VNC server in the network. And, and they you, don't use that password anywhere else either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's just not the... You, there's no centralized management for it. I mean, there might be some solutions for VNC, but the general uh, protocol level you know, regular free stuff that's out there doesn't really have any sort of um, centralized management for usernames and passwords. And it's just generally not a great idea. Um, so this is awesome because when I am a pet, when I do pen testing and I discover you have VNC across tons of machines on your network, I'm going to go especially hard after those devices. And once I get one of those, I'm going to have access to all of them most likely. And so to stay with the spirit of the, of the talk, the, the uh the official defender response to this is, is approved software lists, uh, standardized baselines, and enforcement of those. If, if something like log me in shows up, it needs to be removed. The user needs to be um, chastened. <laughs> I'll be nice. Uh, third party software, uh, excuse me, the two factor auth, if, if strong authentication is required, needs to happen everywhere. Um, so, so, so I mentioned LogMeIn also because LogMeIn actually does have the capability to do two-factor auth, I believe. And you can create multiple user groups. And if you pay for their corporate account or whatever, you can have uh, different groups that different people can log into and have access to different machines. Um, so when it comes to like software like this, LogMeIn, I wouldn't say, is in inherently insecure. Uh, it's configuration of it and putting you know, too much into it and then providing a single user account with every single computer in your network that you know, if you get that one user account, you suddenly have everything. So um, when it comes to things like that, you have to weigh whether or not it's worth it in your network if that's something you want to deal with. Probably most of the time not. No. Uh, there are already solutions like VPN and remote desktop that do this very well. Uh, and then I would just say, never, ever use VNC. All right. Uh, and then this is one I wanted to kind of rant on. Um, third party appliances on your network really suck. Um, 
they're, they're really good for IT operations. It is, I mean, it's ridiculously easy to stand up a new server when it's an ISO VM image. It's awesome. I can, I can have a new service running in five minutes sometimes. Right, but the problem is you, you don't really have any way to vet the security of that appliance, it, especially if it's something that's proprietary, if it's something that you cannot actually access, if you don't have root to it, if it's compiled binaries that you can't you know, debug and, and check to see if there are vulnerabilities. And there's just a ton of issues. Um, I mean, some of the small things I've seen, Misconfigured services. Oh, great! You had a you know Apache installed, and you had it misconfigured to give you uh, root listings or directory listings, and then you had like password or it stored passwords in clear text in the root listing. Or uh, I mentioned insecure proprietary software. Maybe they implemented their own FTP server that you know is has vanilla exploits in it. Uh, default credentials that you can't change is actually a really common one. And sometimes you even get uh, a lower level. Maybe you get a, an admin user, but even though there's a root user, and you can't change that root user's password. You can only change the admin user's password. Well, the, the crappy thing is that with that is, if if they provide you this image and they have a root password included in that image you don't know about, one you automatically have they have like a backdoor into your system. Yeah, that's, and that's the developer backdoor. Uh, yes, and two once you. Once someone like me owns that system and then cracks that password or whatever, uh, suddenly I have that password to every install there, and it's it's simple. Um, I actually w one of the uh, more recently about uh, two months ago I did an assessment on a company that had a third-party appliance that managed um, voicemails. It was like their PBX system and voicemail system, and it was just riddled with issues. Uh, one of them. It backed up to an FTP server that wasn't encrypted and had no credentials. So we easily grabbed the passwords there. It gra backed up the ad. It grabbed up. It gra backed up Etsy Shadow. So I had the admin password or admin password hash and the root password hash. I cracked both of those in like a second because they were both four-digit passwords. And this is the this is the hard configured root password for this service. Though so, so it had root password. And then even if you did have the admin password. If you SSH'd into it, uh, it actually provided you with like this really neat user interface, uh, kind of like old style Telnet, like hit one, two, three, and go through things. Well, it had this functionality in this interface to actually open up um, Links 2. And Links 2 is a uh, text web browser. So as the admin user, you can open up a text web browser. Well, when you opened up the text web browser, it, started, it didn't start as a user admin. It actually started it as the user root. So you're running a text web browser that's feature packed, I might add, running as root, which means you can just go into the settings in the web browser and there's an, I said feature packed, it lets you drop into shell. So, you, so as the admin user, you actually get to drop into shell. So I was able to gain root shell access just by logging in via SSH with the known user, or admin user password, drop into shell, and then suddenly I'm root. It's ridiculous. And on top of that, every single password in the system, because it managed voicemail passwords, it managed user interface passwords, every single password was in clear text. And when you went to go visit that user in the application, it would send back the password of that user. But it's okay, because it, it used the password type text field in HTML, so you couldn't actually see oh, what so it was. so there were stars. Yes, it was a bunch of stars, and I had no Ooh. idea. But there, there are just a million issues with these things. And so it just the, the closing point, um, put extra time into these. Uh, what I would suggest from, from personal painful experience, uh, if your policy dictates you know, a certain level of hardening, of, of scanning and testing will be done against servers, against services, against appliances, um, these third-party appliances have to go through that same process, or they should. Your policy should dictate that. Um, and you should be working with the vendors that provide these. Um, I, I don't want to call anybody on the carpet. Um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a fan of Tenable. I like Nessus a lot. Uh, they make some really cool stuff. They make some other stuff too. Um, they love to sell these uh, proprietary, I think it's CentOS, um, Linux virtual appliances, and they're stripped bare insofar as the interface mode. It's all web browser flash driven, which is the first problem. 
There's no shell login that you know of. So it looks really secure. But when you start picking at it, um, like anything else, they had to get the product out by a ship date. So they had deadlines to meet. And I, I can't say for certain whether all the due diligence has been done. So for that example, I would say always make sure your appliances are, are tested to your degree of, of comfort. Don't assume because it's a, it's a, it's a well-known vendor, it's a high-profile service or, or system, and they give you this hardened appliance, don't assume it's safe because it's probably not. Right, and then if, if you're not testing all, so if you, if say, let's say you're in a uh, Windows, majorly Windows uh, environment, you, you have Windows guys, they are super securing the Windows operating systems, they know domain admin stuff, they know Active Directory stuff, back and forth, they have these awesome group policies, uh, it's super locked down. What happens if you suddenly introduce a vulnerable Linux appliance into their network? I mean, how are they going to know how to properly test and vet that it is secure in their network when they're Windows guys? Like, they may not have the experience necessary. So if you're bringing in an appliance that utilizes some different software, suddenly they're, you know, uh, out of luck with, you know, being able to say that this is good and they got nothing. Cool. All right. So what, um, it, like I said, it's, a lot of it's all basic stuff. Um, Everyone always fails a few of them. Like, everyone always fails something. It's always just basic things. They always forget to do something. And it's always the basic stuff that gets us in. Like, it's just simple things. So, really, I mean, how can these be prevented? Um, checklists. <laughs> uh, seriously, it's policy and it's due diligence and it's um, going through these things ad nauseum. I am. Um, my previous position, I actually worked for the government for a, an agency that uh, about the third time I asked for an overall technical review of the environment, uh, they threatened to fire me because they thought I was wasting resources. And it turned out that we actually found a couple things that were missed and a, and a major vulnerability was discovered. So it's, it's being a pain in the butt it's, and, and saying the policy says this, we have to do it. Um, there was a recent article, Pirates versus Ninjas, talking about supposed personality types in the industry. Um, ninja, pirate. Um, although Kyle, I'm does, all right with that. He he has the he has the gift of gab too, so he's got some pirate traits. Um, getting up and saying, "Look, we're not doing these things right. I think we're not being safe enough." That is really the driving force here. These aren't these aren't technical solutions. These are personal solutions. These are you know personality and driving the policy. Just because we passed last week's scan doesn't mean we're passing this week. And, and of course, follow through is never easy. I mean, just because you have a policy that says you can't have insecure web apps, well, that's great. Like, that's not going to stop you from accidentally coding that's in something that's insecure. I mean, policy is kind of just there, and especially in the developer ends. Like, what does that mean for the developer? It's kind of a joke. So there should at least be some sort of checklist there should be documentation that is designed around the concept of all right so you've installed something what do you do all right so you configured it that's cool okay well first checklist did you change the default password yes I did second checklist is the backup directory secured yes it is and so on uh, so installing apps is it configured correctly uh, I've seen apps in like a halfway installed limbo like the admin or the guy will install it a little bit, it'll configure itself just enough to be usable, and then he'll kind of forget about it, and it reveals things that shouldn't be accessed, like a step three of the installation process that lets you change passwords or something, just little things like that. Um, when you're helping a user, there's, you don't need to know the user's password, right? I mean, if the user needs help, just reset their password, and. Uh, I mean, it sucks because now they have to remember a new password and they may hate you, but... Aww. Yeah, right? Oh, I feel so change bad. Change the password, use it, change it again. So on. Uh, and then, again, storing backups. Make sure you're using a secure protocol, encrypt them, whatever. Make sure that the device that has all of your stuff is also secure. I mean, it's just as, if not more sensitive than every other device in your network. And I think that's all. Oh, I forgot to add your name. That's okay, they can spam you. Oh. Anyway, uh, anybody have any questions or input? Because I would really love input on 
other stupid things that I didn't think about that we see all the time. Nobody? Okay. Oh. I was just going to say li listen for broadcast services. That's a pretty default one, right? Oh, yes. So, uh, do you want to elaborate on that? I didn't hear what you said. Broadcast services. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I don't have anything to elaborate on that. But, I mean, there's tons of stuff like, yeah, SNMP. Uh, I mean, how many times have we gone, all right, default for, default credentials for like Cisco router, whatever, is changed, but SNMP is enabled and you can, yeah, you can publicly change the, the password or SNMP, SNMP v1 is enabled and just fun stuff. Yes. Uh, okay, so here's another stupid one. Um, Louder. Stop. Uh, no passwords on stick it notes or post it notes. That's another really obvious one that people, for some reason, I can never learn. Really? You still can't. You just want to I was saying uh, no passwords on no passwords. Uh, post it notes. That's one that people do not seem to learn. Stop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no passwords on sensitive services or no pass, no passwords at all. Yeah, guest accounts. Okay. Admin portals. Yes. Cool. We're done. Just a reminder to everybody: we have been here recording, and if you're interested in any of the DVDs, see us back here at the table. Thank you. Okay, guys, I have a quick announcement to make. Uh, so we're going to have food now. Please line up on that side, just like we did yesterday. Um, also, if you want to see Will uh, and Bob's talk, um, it will be in the smaller room. So it will not be in this room. It will be in the smaller one. And please be there 15 minutes prior to, the to what is announced in the schedule. So uh, you should be there five minutes to one o'clock. They will start with a small demonstration. Um, so that's it. Uh, the other thing is if you would like